What's cracking, big dogs? Back at you again with another main film. This week's bunk bed breakdowns. Again, the Godfather himself has uh, has basically been slacking and not showing up for another episode. I'm joking. We actually fired him. We're taking over. This is me and Noah's show. We're taking over BDG. You're not going to see Nick anymore. He's in a body bag. Uh, but we're going to be taking over from now. Or it might be like a Friday night at like 10 o'clock. <laughs> and he's yeah. not down or, or he might just be sipping on a bunch of margs, passed out on his couch. Uh, or he might be going to... I don't know, some 60s club based on what I saw animals dressed in earlier today in that full on, full on jumpsuit, track suit. Plus, I kind of respect that. That's like how my brother dresses. And I'm like, yeah, I, the gold, pull the, it off, I think I, the golden, uh, the golden bracelet was the, was the key to that entire outfit. I couldn't pull it off. Animal, animal definitely pulling it off. So big shout out to him. Listen, today we're recording on Friday. And the reason why is because uh, I'm, I'm like driving down uh, south to San Diego. Uh, we're going to be going to my, my girlfriend's uh, house down there for a week. So won't have all the, all the gear, you know, this, this uh, deep, sexy voice you guys listen to every week, the, the lights shining on my face. Won't have any of that. So we're going to record early, but more importantly, the reason why we're recording early is because we're going to cover a topic that doesn't require us watching the games. And it's something that everyone should be pumped about. I've moved on to this, like, I don't know before the season even started, but it's 2021 rookies. Because if you're playing in Dynasty, man, rookie season is the best season. There is no off season. We're always prepping. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be a great class. And we're going to talk about some of the big guys. We're also going to talk about maybe some of the guys you guys don't know that much unless you follow us. So before we get into that, though, man, you know what time it is. <laughs> Kicking it off, let's talk about the big guys first. And in Superflex, I think there's really not much of a question between who the top two guys are. It's Justin Fields and it's Ter- Trevor Lawrence. Most people have uh, Trevor Lawrence 101. Uh, I would not disagree with that. He is definitely up there in terms of his talents as a prospect. Uh, the COVID thing was was kind of unfortunate. Uh, I kind of just hope that he sat out, to be honest. This guy has proven more than he's proved. He walked on, won the national championship as a true freshman, got back to the national championship again, uh, and then, you know, obviously lost the, the greatest offense we've ever seen in the Joe Burrow-led LSU offense. But he's done everything that he can. He has, I think, in, if we tally up, like, how much – how much head he's gotten at Clemson, it's got to be Hall of Fame numbers. we we got to be talking like, you know. Well, you would be a D3 for- quarterback and rack up those bodies. <laughs> it doesn't matter if you're Clemson that's or true. Liberty, who we're going to talk about later. It doesn't really matter. That's true. That's true. I mean, but look, he's, he's incredible. He's uh, incredible. We're excited. Chances are he'll go to like the New York Jets. But look, when you buy into a quarterback, especially the 101, they're always going to a shitty team, right? Like Joe Burrow went to a shitty team. Uh, like Tua went to a shitty team. Justin Herbert, the God, went to a shitty team, right? And Kyler Murray went to a shitty that's, team. But if you, if all right, you guys, believe- that's this week's episode. <laughs> we want to start calling charges a shitty team. We're out of here. We'll see you. <laughs> but if we, but if you believe in the talent, they are that piece that turns that team around. So don't be too scared off. I would say I'll, I would be concerned a little bit if Adam Gase stays. Let's see what happens there. But there's a good chance Adam Gase leaves, right? And we plop Trevor Lawrence into a team with with Denzel Mims, who's a pretty talented wide receiver, uh, and you know, see what happens. He's a talented guy. So I don't know what your thoughts are. Justin Fields versus Trevor Lawrence. I think it's a lot closer than people make it out to be. I actually really love Justin Fields. I've I followed both of these guys since high school. I uh, watched him in the Elite 11 and, and, you know, go through that competition. Justin Fields actually beat out Trevor Lawrence for that. Um, so it was just an exciting time. But what are your thoughts, man? Are you, are you going to – let's say Trevor Lawrence lands in the New York Jets and Justin Fields lands on the Jaguars or, like, something like that. What do you think? Who, who, who are you taking 101 Superflex? Well, first I want to say is I think last year we were kind of dying on the hill, like, oh, you don't need to take a quarterback 101 because he's, there's oh, these yeah. talented running backs. I think this year is different – not because Joe Burrow isn't as good as these guys, which I don't think he is coming out of college, but it's also because the skill set that these guys bring to the table is kind of unlike Joe Burrow in the sense that they can throw and they can run. Trevor Lawrence can run. Justin Fields can run. It's not their first options, but they can do it. And it's something that Justin Herbert has shown as a rookie, even Joe Burrow a little bit. We've seen out of Danny Dimes. These guys have arm talent. Uh, They can definitely run the ball as well. Obviously, as Mike said, Trevor Lawrence is basically getting the consolation prize of going to the Jets. Like, he was so good throughout his entire career. He won the award of playing for the New York Jets. So, congrats to you, Trevor. Justin Fields, though, if he does land in Jacksonville, I think the 101 and 102 conversation is going to be extremely tight because you look at what happens in Jacksonville right now. Like Jake Luton had a decent game a few weeks ago. Gardner Minshew is like a top-12 quarterback on a point-per-game basis with the weapons that they have, and that's with DJ Chark 
in a brand new offense with Jay Gruden just coming over. That's with LaVisca Chanel as a rookie. That's with James Robinson in his first year in the NFL being an undrafted rookie. I think the situation for Justin Fields in the short term is going to be a lot better than Trevor Lawrence. But as you said, right, once Adam Gase is out of there, they have a very talented wide receiver in Jameson Crowder out of the slot. They have Denzel Mims, who they just sunk a second-round pick into, who hasn't done a whole lot, but he's extremely talented and athletic. I think that the fact that they invested in a left tackle on Mekhi Becton helps his longevity there as well. So I think I would still go Trevor Lawrence in New York. You'd, it's probably a tough pill to swallow, knowing you're picking a Jet 101. But I think the talent is there. The hair is there. The swagger is there. As Mike said, the bodies are for sure there. Uh, <laughs> but I guess, I mean, you can't go wrong with either, right? Justin Fields, if he lands in Jacksonville, is going to have two really solid receivers on the outside and a good running game behind him uh, to support him there. So I think either way, it's it's looking up for the quarterback landscape. And past these guys, right, there's Mac Jones, who is kind of having a Joe Burrow type of rise, not to his heights, but kind of a similar trajectory where he was kind of an afterthought. Nobody had him on their big boards. Now he's maybe a first-round pick. Uh, Zach Wilson out of BYU is putting up crazy numbers. Trey Lance has kind of fallen off the map a little bit, but he's still really good. He's a dual-threat quarterback as well. But I'd say for most of these guys, it really depends on draft capital and where they land. Like Drew Locke was a second-round pick. People are hyped about him. When you see him go to Denver in the second, kind of lost a little bit of steam. Same with Dwayne Haskins, right? He was supposed to be a top five, top six pick. He goes, what was it, like 16 or 17 to the Redskins or to the Washington football team. Uh, so it really depends with a lot of these guys, the landing spot and the draft capital sunk into them. But it's it's a pretty deep and talented class. And one guy I want to talk about, and I'm not sure if you look too deep into him, Mike, is Malik Willis. Or Malik Willis, I can't even say the guy's name, from Liberty. He has somehow brought this team to national relevance. Uh, they're ranked 21st as of right now. I'm not sure what's going to happen after this weekend, but they don't play the best competition. I don't even know what division Liberty is in. All I know is Antonio Gandy-Golden looked pretty good there last year. And this guy, Malik Willis, <laughs> It might not seem like high praise, but to me, he looks and plays a lot like Tyrod Taylor, right? He's got kind of a skinnier frame, 6'1", 195, but he can blaze. He was actually recruited at Auburn. He was there for, I believe, two years, and then he transferred out to Liberty. And apparently, he ran a 4'4 flat coming out of high school. Obviously, these numbers are a little bit sketchy, but looking at his rushing numbers this year, seven games, 700 yards on the dot, nine rushing touchdowns. He only has one game where he didn't score a touchdown, and he's had either 80 He's had 80 and a touchdown in all but one game. He has a fire hose for an arm. He can run the ball. I'm not sure what the pedigree of a Liberty quarterback is going to do for him in terms of draft capital, but the numbers he's putting up, like a 67% completion percentage isn't bad. I'm not sure about the receivers there. Obviously, the competition isn't too stiff, so the numbers are going to be a little bit inflated, but I really like the dual threat skill set that he brings to the table. And in fantasy football, that's what you're looking for. You're looking for somebody that can run, you can throw, pick up chunk plays on the ground and through the air by throwing it deep or just running really well. And I think that's what Malik Willis can bring to the table at the next level. Yeah, he's been pretty exciting. Uh, personally, I don't, I don't really follow like these type of like small school guys as much because I'm just going to let draft capital do the, do the speaking for me, uh, mostly on quarterbacks. And I just think, you know, I focus on Trevor Lawrence, Justin Fields. It's a clear, clear, clear tier, tier cut after them. Between them, not only the other QBs, but them and the other positions as a whole in Superflex. So I think that's 101, 102. And then, you know, someone like Zach Wilson, who's having a meteoric rise, I think his rise has been even higher than, than Mac Jones in terms of the hype level uh, from mainstream media. So if he goes to like a top 10 pick, right, that'll be interesting. And then Mac Jones as well. I would love to see Mac Jones land somewhere uh, with, with some nice weapons that kids been balling out. So look, it's, I, I would say this, like it's a really deep quarterback class, right? Which is great, great, great for super flex drafts, especially for those second round picks that allow you to land some of these guys, like someone like someone like Malik, like I would, I would bet you can get him in like the, the early third, like late second, depending on if he, where he goes, right. If he gets like day two draft cap or something like that. And that's an interesting dart to throw, but uh, let's, let's go back to running backs now real quick. Now that we covered uh, quarterbacks, obviously, you know, very similar, clear cut, I did two, two, like it's Najee Harris, right? I think he is the running back one. And then it's Travis Etienne. I mean, they're both, they're both really good players, but different styles, right? Like, you know, I think Najee Harris is probably the most landing spot independent guy. He is, he is built really, really. He's, I mean, he's got prototypical size. He's like, what, like six, two, like two, probably two thirty ish. He's built right? kind of like a smaller Derrick Henry, but his play style it couldn't be further from Derrick Henry. Derrick Henry yeah. predicates his game on breaking away <clears throat> to the outside and running fast. Najee Harris 
He, I, I think he reminds me a little bit of DeMarco Murray, but I feel like DeMarco Murray's back was way too stiff to draw the comparison. <laughs> Najee Harris is a big dude, but he is very slippery. There was a play, I think it was against Auburn. It was like a fourth and two or something. And this probably doesn't help you guys at all because I'm not going to throw it on the screen because iMovie doesn't let me do this stuff and I don't want copyright strikes. But it was like a fourth and two. They run it to the right. It should have been a five-yard loss. And the guy just slipped out of like five tackles and picked up like four yards. And, you know, 4.0 yards per carry isn't going to wow anybody. But the moves that he puts on, the fact that he can catch the ball out of the backfield, he's extremely elusive. He maybe doesn't have that breakaway speed, maybe like a Clyde Overtelaire or James Robinson. Guess what? Those guys have been pretty good in the NFL as well. He has the prototypical workhorse size. I think if he lands he somehow in Miami. Bit. I don't know if that I don't know if that matters for the recording or not, but you froze and like from from my side. Yeah, I think from my side it'll be all right because as long all as right, mine good. is good. Yeah, it's my Wi Fi is real shitty right here. Um, but as I was saying, Najee Harris has prototypical size. If he lands in a place like Miami, who has shown to want to use a workhorse running back, I think that's the best situation possible. A little reuniting with my boy Tua Tagovailoa, or not my boy. Um, basically making Justin Herbert the consolation prize for the Chargers. But uh, I think he, as you said, is very landing spot independent because he has such a well-rounded skill set. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he is definitely the most complete back, and I think you could find a kind of just slot him in anywhere. The, the most beautiful thing about Najee Harris is he, for his size, I find him to be extremely agile and nimble, and he's got excellent hands. He's not just a running back that catches passes. He can be used as a legit receiving weapon. Like, we've seen that, like, he... He can make contested catches. He can make over-the-shoulder catches. He can make all the tough grabs you want to see, like, downfield as well. So I think that's what's really exciting because he's that and he's got that size, right? And, and you know, the other part of it is he is a serial winner. And if you guys follow me at all, you know I love betting on serial winners. That's why I bet on T. Higgins. Uh, but Najee Harris – That's why I bet on Denzel Mims going to <laughs> – <laughs> Najee Harris was the number one ranked running back coming into the nation. And, uh, you know, he – put the team on his back last year and he put the team on his back again this year and it's just exciting to see so if he gets that draft capital it's going to be wheels up on the other side of it though Travis Etienne I think is a more landing spot dependent but if he lands in the perfect spot his ceiling can absolutely exceed Najee Harris in my opinion Mike what if he lands in San Francisco that's that's the spot that's the spot that I was talking about like because his style he is a cannon you just you just point him and you shoot him out He's what camp. everybody wanted Matt Breida to be the year Carlos Hyde like left and Alfred yeah. Morris ended up being the guy for half a season. Yeah. Like Travis Etienne has like elite acceleration. Like the way he just gets up to top speed is so quick. He actually runs kind of funny when I watch him. It, like it looks like he's like running, like kind of struggling with a limp, but he's just so fast. It doesn't look pretty, but he gets it done. And, and, you know, film grinders love the term, you know, I'm sure you'd love this one, Noah. Uh, contact balance and Love to hear. <laughs> i don't know exactly what that means what i what i think it means is the way that he absorbs contact and is able to keep his momentum moving forward and also stay on his feet is is really good so like a very alvin kamara like in that respect like alvin kamara knows how to absorb the contact and keep going that's why he breaks when he tackles etn brings that to the table he does not bring the receiving skills to the table he is a dump off passer but that's good enough for fantasy purposes anyways but yeah i would love to see him land on a San Francisco 49ers where Kyle Shanahan is scheming these like wide open gaps for him, which he will, he will absolutely take some of those and take it to the house easily. Yeah. He's like Raheem. I almost said Raheem Morris shout out Falcons. <laughs> he's like Raheem Mostert, but like seven years younger and hopefully not going to be injured every play. The thing that people are talking about, not, uh, Travis Etienne about is, Oh, can he handle a workload? He plays for Clemson. He's not, he's not hold. not that he's not holding up. They're not giving him workload. I mean, you play for Clemson. You don't need to carry the ball 25 times a game. He is a little bit of a smaller stature guy, but we've seen so many people, like players, I guess, bringing up Miles Sanders and Austin Eckler aren't great given what happened to them this year, but it's not like they – whatever. I'm not going to bring that up because that kills my argument. But uh, as you said, he's an extremely talented running back. Uh, he actually said, I think after his freshman year, that he's like afraid to catch the ball. And then he went out and caught like 30 passes. Now he's on pace to catch another like 40 passes this year. As you said, he's not an elite receiver, so – don't expect that to be part of his role at the next level, but he is capable out of the backfield. And he's one one of those guys that, as you said, is shot out of a cannon. And although he's not a great receiver, he's not going to use like an Alvin Kamara, he's going to be somebody that out of the backfield you want to get the ball in his hands one or two times a game, kind of like what we see out of Derrick Henry. Like he's not a great pass catcher, but you can dump it off to him and hopefully he picks up enough speed to gain some yards after the catch. So he's somebody that I also really like. He's my 102 or my second highest ranked running back coming into this year after Najee Harris, but somebody else who I think Chuba Hubbard was like kind of seen as the 103 of this group. 
but for me, it's Javante Williams out of UNC. This guy kind of came out of nowhere. I mean, he was really good last year as well, but he wasn't a big name guy, but he comes into this season looking like an absolute menace, averaging over 100 rushing yards a game, almost two rushing touchdowns a game. He can catch the ball out of the backfield. He is the prototypical size at 5'10", 220. He reminds me a whole lot of this channel's favorite running back, James Robinson. He is not going (laughs) to burst out of the hole and run 80 yards for a touchdown. He's not going to blow you away with his speed. But what he is going to do is pick up as many yards as he can and then some. Uh, He has great vision. He has great contact balance. Mike, I know you love to hear it. But he also just has that size, and he has the all-around skill set that I think is going to be coveted at the next level. Obviously, running backs are heavily dependent on where they go. Uh, We want to see how they test because me saying Javante Williams doesn't have breakaway speed can all be wiped away by a 4-4 somehow at the combine. But from what I saw, he doesn't seem like that type of guy. But if he is, you know, a day two pick to a team that wants a running back, which at this point is up in the air, we don't really know who's in the market for a running back. I remember last year we did a video like who's going to choose a running back this year. And none of the teams (laughs) we talked about actually ended up choosing them. But uh, with any running back, most of the time, it's really dependent on where they land. Like Clyde Ritalera was the fifth or sixth guy off the board prior to him landing on the Chiefs. And then he was the first or second guy off the board. So, uh, but he's just somebody to look and uh, keep an eye on because of the skill set, because of his production this year. And because he seems to profile as a three down back at the next level. Yeah. I mean, he's someone that's rose, rose him up really quickly. Um, I think our boy, homie, Ray GQ, uh, he brought him up. And that's when I started paying attention. Uh, Devi Asu, uh, Devi Asu. What, fuck, I can never pronounce the name, man. Wasn't it Fusu Vu or something? Yeah. Yeah. Fusu Vu. Absolute Twitter legend. The God himself that called James Robinson over CEH. Uh, he, he actually pointed him out as well. So I've been paying more attention. I think, you know, if you guys remember from last year, we did a ton of like rookie breakdowns where like Noah broke down the film and I broke down the analytics and we made a cool little video and edited some shit. We'll probably do a bunch of those. I have a feeling Javante Williams is going to make that list uh, at some point in this off season to make sure you stay tuned. We'll dig in a little deeper then, but for now, prototype size, production, receiving ability, he checks all the boxes that he can check at this point um, before the draft and before all that stuff. So He's the one. He's one to keep an eye on. And you know, Ray said this, and I respect Ray a ton. He said Javante Williams is a better three profiles is a better three down back than Travis Etienne. And I don't disagree because one, he's got the size, and two, like we said, Travis Etienne is very limited in his skill set. But what he is good at, he's elite. So this is like the trio. Very sad. Very sad. My guy, Journey Brown, who was my running back three, is no longer playing. Uh, he has some serious medical concerns. Happily, he found that, so it doesn't affect him down the line. But he was definitely the running back three for me. And he was inching up into that tier one. I thought he was incredible. And I tweeted out the stat about him rushing for 790 yards in a high school game. Just fucking absurd. Just like one of the most absurd stat lines I've ever seen. Actually, no, he had two of the most absurd stat lines I've ever seen. His first stat line was rushed for 790 yards, and like 30 carries. The next game, he had like 170 yards on like seven carries or something like that. He was average like 30 <laughs> yards you're per You're a D1 carry. athlete. High school stat, stats <laughs> yeah. just like don't make sense sometimes. It's just insane. Anyway, sad news about him leaving. But this after this is a very, very clear drop. Like this is not a talented running back class. It's really going to be – what I think is going to happen is like it's going to be similar to the 2019 class where like landing spot and like draft capital – boost these guys way too much you're gonna get people drafting guys like devin singletary in like the late first you're gonna get guys drafting fucking david montgomery in the top five that's what's gonna happen because there's a little bit of a lack of the draft class which is good for us if you're paying attention to this to this channel you know we love analyzing wide receivers that is our favorite position that's noah's favorite position to watch that's my favorite position to analyze because there's so much data to like intake for them and man i got some good news boys i got some good news but before we get to that good first, news, I have, a, I, have a few, I have a few running backs that I want to hit on real quick. All right, yeah, hit them up. Just real quick, I have, a, I have a few comps. So Kenny Gainwell from Memphis. Obviously, yeah. everybody out of Memphis. Like, talking about a Memphis running back is like talking about a Big 12 receiver. Like, yeah, no oh, shit, dude. they're going to do well. All they do is play no defense. Memphis's offense is built around creating running backs because the holes – are bigger than the ones you see in LA. Daryl Henderson recently, you have Tony Pollard, you have Antonio Gibson, who is more of a Swiss Army knife. But Kenny Gainwell is somebody who, as a redshirt freshman, went out there, put up 2,000 yards from scrimmage, 16 touchdowns, 51 receptions. He's a little bit undersized, but to me, he kind of reminds me of an Austin Eckler type, somebody who is extremely fast. I know out of high school, he only ran like a 4.68, which 
doesn't seem like what he is going to run at the combine if he comes out this year because he does have a lot of breakaway plays. But he's somebody who is an extremely good athlete, somebody who's great out of the backfield uh, catching passes. He's not going to be somebody that's going to be drafted to a team to be a workhorse back. But I think just like Austin Eckler, he can be a 1B to somebody's 1A. And if that 1A were to get hurt, he could go out there and produce. Maybe kind of like a Chase Edmonds situation this year where – he is not getting anywhere near like 15, 20 touches a game. But because of the production and the ability to be used out of the backfield as a weapon, I think that's going to be coveted by NFL teams. And he's going to land in a spot that wants to utilize him as such. So he's somebody to keep an eye on. And then JV and Hawkins, I watched some of his film. And before you, Sorry, before you move on, JV and Hawkins, actually glad you brought Kenny Gale. I don't know how I forgot about him. Uh, he's actually he's actually hella talented, but like, you know, if you think back to all the complaints about like, oh, Antonio Gibson only had 33 carries, only had 33 carries. Mm-hmm. You know why he had only 33 carries? Because of this guy. Because this guy was too good to be kept off the field. And we're seeing now what Antonio Gibson is doing in the NFL. We're even seeing what Darrell Henderson is doing in the NFL. And we've seen limited touches of what Tony Pollard can do. And this guy is probably the, I don't know, I don't want to say the best. I love Antonio Gibson. But production-wise, like resume-wise, he's probably the best out of all of them. So it's going to be exciting to see him play. And, and like you said, he is a receiver out of the backfield, not just a dump off specialist. Yeah. And then the last guy is Javian Hawkins. I was looking at like the ESPN recruit stuff and it has all the guys who had like the highest athletic testing. This guy ran a four, three, six, a 40.6 inch vertical and his spark score is like one thirty something. He was basically number one in three different categories, but he was 167 pounds when he did that. He's up to 196 right now, but still when you watch him on tape, he is a burner. He plays for Louisville. Uh, I forgot to mention that, but he reminds me a whole lot of, Philip Lindsay. He's just more of a straight line guy. Isn't going to really break through a ton of tackles. Uh, no type of contact balance there. And, you know, he's, he's not going to, he's not going to blow you away with elusiveness or power or anything like that. But it's going to be interesting to see where he goes because, you know, last year he put a 1500 yards as a redshirt freshman. This year he's averaging over or almost 120 rushing yards per game. He's not a great receiver out of the backfield. So for fantasy purposes, seems to be like a one to a first and second down running back that relies heavily on speed and breakaway plays. So, Uh, Just keep an eye on him. Also, like a guy like Max Borgie. I don't think he's playing this year, but he got a whole lot of hype. Then again, anybody in Washington State's offense, yeah, he kind of stinks. Washington State's offense is built around just short passes, and he caught like a million balls, but not for too many yards. People wanted to say he was Christian McCaffrey because he's white and caught passes. I was white and caught passes at one point. I'm not (laughs) Christian McCaffrey, so we're going to move on from them. Nick also likes C.J. Verdell. He told me to look into him. Uh, I didn't see enough about him to be able to talk confidently on him. But Nick likes him, which means he's probably going to bust like Denzel Mims because everybody Nick and I like get overtaken by <laughs> wide receivers and other people that run four sevens and are apparently really good at football. Yeah. Uh, look, those are the running backs. They're pretty thin. Like basically it passed Najee Harris and Travis Etienne and Javante. Like you're, you're looking at pretty slim pickings. But, you know, like we said, that means we're rich in other areas. And we are definitely really rich in wide receivers. And there are some clear tier breaks for me here. But, you know, the top guys, we're not going to talk about too much because everyone's probably heard of them. You know, Jamar Chase, former Bolenikoff winner, Rondell Moore, uh, former Paul Horning winner for the most first stall player. These guys are studs. We know him. We know they are. Rashad Bateman, also in that group, I think, that, that trio of really, really talented guys. Yeah, after um, them, it's kind of a clear cutoff. And, you know, Mike, speaking of cutting things off, We've got this week's sponsor, Manscaped. You know, the holidays are here. Have you made your wish list yet? Our sponsor today has the number one wished for gift of the year, Manscaped, the best in men's below the belt and above the belt grooming. Manscaped is here to ensure you're taking care of your manhood and your nose hairs with the new performance package. Mike, you can get the lawnmower 3.0. You can get the weed whacker, which can trim your nose hairs. I don't think we're at the age yet where that's an issue, but maybe somebody in the audience is. Maybe their wife is like, bro, Come on, clean that up. You got to go out there. You got to clean that up for your wife. Happy wife, happy life, winning fantasy team. Look good, feel good, feel good, play good with the performance package. It also comes with a pair of chafe-free boxer briefs. It comes with some ball toner, ball deodorant. It's got a little bag so you can carry stuff around. Mike, you just talked about your girlfriend earlier. I'm sure she appreciates, you know, a little a little manscaping. You got you to gotta respect your woman. And you got to, more importantly, respect yourself. And if you don't shave your balls, you clearly don't do that. Because nobody, nobody, not, not, not your girlfriend, not your one-night stand, not, not that girl that's in your class that, you're, that you've been trying to hit on. Nobody wants to pull down Personal your pants. Shot, Mike. I feel it. Pull down your pants and see a fucking jungle down there, right? Nobody, nobody. So make sure you clean up, man. Take care of yourself. I don't push products that I don't like. 
And I've been a user of Manscaped for, you know, I don't know, years now. I'm actually kind of tilted that we didn't get this freaking sponsorship earlier because I had to buy a new one earlier this year because I lost it. Uh, so I didn't even get that. But look, my pain is your gain. So make sure you guys take advantage, man. Get that promo code in there. Get that thing and start cleaning that shit up. All right. That's, that's, that's just, it's just basic decency now. You just gotta yeah, and by the looks of me, I may not look like a well-kept <laughs> guy. My hair is kind of going crazy. Mike kind of made fun of what's going on in my face. But believe you me, I have a few testimonials that would be very happy about the Manscaped and the usage that I've gotten out of it. So <laughs> if you want to get 20% off and free shipping with the code, use the code BDGE at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code BDGE. Those letters stand for Big Dogs Gotta Eat. What are you waiting for? Go whack your weeds and make Santa proud. Mike, back to some of these receivers. Let's make us proud with the tier two guys. Tier two, for me, I've got Seth Williams. I think, I think one of the most disrespected and underrated guys. He has, they don't make guys like Seth Williams. Anymore. He plays on Auburn and don't get fooled by his stats because Bo Nix kind of stinks Dude, um, but fucking sucks i don't I, like i haven't seen yeah. this episode i tried not to <laughs> that guy just pisses me off like he was a freshman yeah. starting last year seth williams to me is everything that i missed t higgins on he is a guy who is not gonna burn you he's not gonna blow you away after the catch but he just catches everything and i'm not sure yeah. if he's that perennial winner that you hit on with t higgins but uh going back to high school or whatever but to me watching him last year bailing out bo nicks on so many occasions this year as well, as you're saying, right, he's not putting up like 150 yards a game, but he's playing in the SEC. He's playing with a kind of garbage quarterback, and he's out there making plays, and he's somebody that I'm not going to fade just because he's not an elite separator. Obviously, guys like Laquan Treadwell and Nikhil Harry have burned us in the past, but uh, when you see talent out there and when you see guys winning in contested situations, I'm willing to make that bet even if it buries me a few, a few years down the line. Yeah, he, I mean, the, the raw stats don't tell the full story, which is why I always say to focus on analytics from a dominator perspective, from a market share perspective. He is the offense. And Bo Nix is awful. Uh, we know that. Uh, I'm going to be interested to see, like, how much of his, how much of his like, targets are actually deemed catchable. Uh, but he, Seth Williams is, like, a towering presence. Like you said, very similar to T. Higgins. Like, he is going to moss you. He is a, a physical receiver. And I love that he plays in the SEC against – which is the only conference and the only schools that actually do any type of press coverage. Uh, so he kind of gets a little bit of exposure to that. Running routes, I'm sure it's great and all, but that's not the only way to win. You know, Seth Williams wins, like, he wins the way that, like, Des Bryant won, right? Which is just just winning contested catches and just tossing up there and letting, letting him make a play. And that's, that's what he brings to the table. He brings running after the catch to the table as well. So I, I think he's really in that second tier. He leads that second tier for me. Uh, but then we got other guys in there. We got Jalen Waddle, who's been incredible uh, this year, apparently he might come back next year too, which is kind of crazy. I hope okay, he does. That would be that would be that would be that would move him down significantly down my ranks if he actually comes back next year, um, because like I think he's ready. Like he's he's got the speed. He, he he is he. I think he's a lot better than Henry Ruggs was in terms of what he what the skill set he brings. He's a lot more explosive. He's a lot more similar to Tyreek Hill than Henry Ruggs was because Jalen Waddle's like. Shorter agility and burst, like, is what Tyreek Hill also has. I didn't think that Henry Ruggs really brought that to the table. So that's why I think they're a little bit similar. But, yeah, he's interesting. If he comes back, uh, I'm not going to like him as much. But if he doesn't and he, and he declares, it's going to be it's gonna be wheels up for him. And then the other guy who I really, I really, really like is, is um, D D uh, fuck, Deami Brown. So that's, that's my dude, North Carolina. Uh, we talked about Javante Williams. But Deami Brown, I think, is one of the most interesting wide receivers. He's a little bit uh, – I guess light on the frame. He's only like 185, but he is a burner. And he, again, similar to Seth Williams, he is that offense. He's got, they got Sam How Howell, the Howitzer back there firing bullets downfield. And Deami Brown, more often than not, is coming down. I'm really interested to see when we do a rookie breakdown on him. No, I'm interested to see your film, film perspective on him because I think he is a pretty interesting prospect. So those are the kind of the guys that I kind of have in that group there. Um, I don't know about you. Maybe do you, do you love Devontae Smith? Because I know Nick really likes Devontae Smith. I, I love Devontae Smith. And I know he's one of those guys that came back as a senior, which I guess metrics-wise or analytically like isn't good for him. But it just seems like whenever he's on the field, he's making plays. No matter if it's Tua behind center, whether it's Mac Jones behind center, whether Jerry Judy's on the other side, whether Jalen Waddle's there, or, uh, she loves Michi, whoever these receivers are. He is he's incredible. I actually want to look up his numbers right now because I don't want to speak out of turn. I'm pretty sure he's got like over 100 yards a game and double-digit touchdowns. Um, already this season, and this is prior to the Saturday slate. Eight touchdowns. He's got nine touchdowns. Nine touchdowns. 
nine. Okay. So what I have here, I think I'm off a little bit, but what I have is six games, 759 yards, eight touchdowns. Oh, and he also ran one in. So nine touchdowns. He is incredible. And to me, not a stylistic comparison in terms of how they play, but kind of situational is similar to Terry McLaurin, right? He's producing a whole lot more than what Terry McLaurin did in college. But I feel like Devonta Smith, despite this production and despite how good he's been for how long he's been there, he's kind of being overlooked because Jerry Judy was obviously that high pedigree pro- prospect coming out last year. Uh, Henry Ruggs as well going top 15 ahead of Jerry Judy. Jalen Waddle this year was getting a bunch of hype. But you look what Devonta Smith has done throughout his entire career. Uh, As a sophomore, he didn't really break out 690 yards, six touchdowns. But then last year, sharing the field with two top, what, 15 picks in the NFL draft, 68 catches, 1,256 yards, 14 touchdowns. He plays a whole lot bigger than what his size says, 6'1", 175. He makes some incredible contested catches. He wins deep down the field. He's a good route runner. And to me, I know it's it's pretty film grinder-ish, but when you're a little bit older, and I'm not sure how this correlates because you can't put a number on route running, but I feel like when you're a little bit of an older prospect and you are a clean route runner like that, that cleans up a lot of the concerns because you don't have to add that to your repertoire at that point. Like if you're a young speedster who isn't really breaking out yet, but you come out as a junior and you want to build on your route running game and your route tree in the NFL, then yeah, that's cool because you're a little bit younger, you have the time to do it. If you already come out pretty polished like Devonta Smith is with the skill set that he has, if he's of day one or day two pick, which I have no doubt he's going to be, and he lands in a spot that is going to use him, obviously like that's what you want out of anybody. But I think he has a skill set to be a day one producer in the NFL. And uh, to me, he's just extremely talented. And I'm not going to weigh too heavily his return just because I feel like he maybe wanted to show that he was a true alpha and not be overshadowed by Jalen Waddle or not Jalen Waddle, Jerry Judy. Yeah, I mean, he. if you look at his game log, it's actually pretty insane. He has two games in the last two years, not one, two games with 200-plus yards and four touchdowns. One of those games, he had 271 yards and five touchdowns. Uh, and he basically dominates Mississippi, like whether it's Mississippi State or Mississippi. Last year was Mississippi. He put up like 271 and five touchdowns. This year versus Mississippi State, put up 203 yards and four touchdowns and versus Mississippi. He put up... 164, another touchdown. So, look, this guy this guy definitely gets it done. I am a little bit concerned about his size. Like, 6'1", 175 is, is slight, man. That is that is very slight. That's like Hollywood Brown type of status. And those guys just like – they're just like an uphill to climb. But undeniably, I am going to defer to you guys on the film. And all the film guys I've seen really, really love this guy. So, I'm, I'm not going to like just write him off because the analytics stinks. Like, you know, I'm not going to make that mistake every time. But – he is definitely an interesting prospect. I just, I just don't have him in the same tier as guys like Seth and, and uh, you know, and and yeah, basically Seth Williams and uh, Deami Brown because mm-hmm. those guys kind of, in my opinion, in my untrained eyes, bring the film and they bring the analytics. So it's kind of exciting to see. But like we said, man, it's a very, very deep class. I think another guy I want to bring up there, and I've talked about him before. I wrote about him in the guide actually. Is Amon Rossi Brown on the USC Trojans? Uh, he, his brother Equinemius St. Browns obviously plays in the NFL, but by all accounts, Amon Ra is that dude, and Equinemius is kind of like that older guy that his parents failed on and gave up on. So this is the pro- prodigal son. It's like Blake Griffin back. and Taylor Griffin. Like one was the <laughs> yeah. first overall pick. The other one is probably just like eating off his plate right now. Yeah, exactly. Um, so that's an interesting one. And then the other one I want to talk about is Terrace Marshall. So Terrace Marshall obviously sat behind uh, both Jamar Chase, who is not playing now, and then also Justin Jefferson, who's basically proving to be one of the best and historically perform- best performing uh, historic rookie wide receiver of all time based on what he's been able to do just playing outside. So, But the second they left, Terrace Marshall has gotten his opportunity, even though this LSU team freaking stinks. Just much like Seth Williams, Terrace Marshall has been getting it done. He has been balling out. He is that entire offense. He is a he's like basically dominating in all aspects of the air uh, of the air production for that team, which is what you love to see. So he doesn't have like that elite, you know, you know, freshman freshman breakout. But what he does bring to the table is this year's been balling out. Even last year, he didn't like he wasn't like a bum. Right? He had forty six catches, six hundred and seventy one yards and thirteen touchdowns. So he was a monster in the red zone. Uh, that entire offense was beastly. But this year without the, the, these other guys and him as a clear number one, he's kind of showing what he's been doing. And he was a five star recruit, highly touted coming out of high school. So kind of going all on that same winner winner mentality. I don't know what your thoughts on. Do you have any thoughts at all on uh, Terrace Marshall? Yeah. Um, first thought, I didn't know his name was Terrace. I thought it was Terrence and I was just trying to look up his numbers and I kept putting an N in there and I was completely wrong. He's somebody that I'm not going to lie. A few of these guys, I haven't looked too much into film. I've said before, I'm not a huge college football watcher. I'll watch whoever's on and LSU happens to be on a lot. He's somebody that I feel like 
if you create a player Madden and you just make them a prototypical size and you give them like all 85s for their stats, I feel like that's like a decent enough average. That's what he is. He's just really good at everything. It seems like he scores a whole bunch of touchdowns. Obviously last year, the whole offense was benefit from Joe Brady and Joe Burrow. But this year, as you said, they don't have that anymore yet. He's still putting up like two touchdowns a game. So he's somebody I haven't looked a whole bunch into. I've seen him play here and there. Um, as far as Diami Brown, you brought up before, I haven't watched too much UNC. I'm not going to lie about that. Same with Amon Ross St. Brown. USC, I haven't seen a whole bunch of that. But they did break out at pretty early ages. Um, and for me as well, I'm going to add this guy to probably the third tier uh, behind where you were saying before with the other guys is Tylen Wallace. I remember writing him up in a draft guide in 2019 as a guy I was excited about in 2020. Towards ACL last year. He only played half the season, which – to me, that makes sense why you would want to come back. If you aren't getting the love and the hype because you have a torn ACL, they don't get to see your athletic testing. Uh, they're a little bit concerned about your health. You want to go back and showcase your skills. And that is exactly what he has done to me. He reminds me so much of Robbie Anderson. If Robbie Anderson started drinking like a 1,000 calorie protein shake a day and put on a little bit more weight, to me, Tylen Wallace is somebody who – fills every single box whether it be analytics and an early breakout age as a true sophomore 86 catches 1491 yards 12 touchdowns last year in just nine games uh, 900 yards eight touchdowns this year in six games 583 yards four touchdowns obviously you play in the big 12 obviously you play Oklahoma State and then Mike Gundy offense you're going to produce but what I like a whole lot about him is it's kind of like what I said with Jalen Rager last year like he played in the big 12 as well it's not just because he plays in the Big 12 that he is producing. You watch him play, and you see what he's doing despite poor defenses. He's going up and mossing guys, and I don't care how bad the DB is. It's not easy to catch a pass when there's two hands in the way of the ball. He goes up. He makes great contested catches. He's also great after the catch. Obviously, defensive backs in the Big 12 don't want to tackle. But then again, like he's breaking off big plays here and there. He is extremely fast in the long game. He is a good route runner. He has decent enough size, like six foot one, 190. And the production just year after year, game after game is there. In his last 28 games since his sophomore season, he's put up 80 yards or a touchdown in 24 of them. So just four times he hasn't either scored or put up 80 yards. Again, I'll say it over and over, Big 12, whatever. He is, to me, he is somebody who is extremely talented. And I feel like if he were to have declared last year, if he were to never get injured, which is a whole bunch of ifs, but I feel like he would have been a guy who is easily a day two pick. And to me, would have been somebody who I like just as much as Brian Edwards. Obviously, him coming back for a senior year hurts him a little bit. But so did Brian Edwards, and he checked every single box, and he ended up being one of my top receivers coming into this class, which didn't end up working out all too well, but he has Derek fucking Carr thrown on the ball. So uh, he's somebody that I'd keep an eye on, see what he tests out as. I want to see what his speed is because I'm pretty sure he ran like a 4.6 coming out of high school. Those numbers are always kind of fluky. Uh, to me, he's, he looks pretty fast to me. Um, and he just seems like somebody that if he is put in an offense in a situation where like Robbie Anderson has been put in this year where he's not just a deep threat, but he's asked to do a little bit of everything, I think he can produce because I'm pretty sure last year, other than like Jajuan Jennings, that guy from Tennessee, Juwan and Jennings. Lamb, he was like, yeah, Jawan Jennings. He was like top five in yards after catch and yards after contact for receiver. So he's somebody that to me looks extremely talented and really checks every single box other than a senior declare. Yeah, I, I'm, uh, the main concern with me when it comes to him is uh, draft capital, whether or not he'll get it. You know, we saw, you know, another, another, um, some other guys come out of like the Big 12 that aren't, that weren't like, uh, like a top program. Mm -hmm. Not, not great, but, you know, I actually did really like what I saw him last, last year as well. So, but I do think, you know, someone that is one last, like kind of, I don't want to say sleeper because he's kind of been balling out. And I'm sure if you actually follow college, uh, you would, you would have seen that, but Elijah Moore mm -hmm. out, of, out of Ole Miss uh, has been just balling. I mean, in his freshman year, he played with uh, DK Metcalf and Adrian Brown who are now basically top two, top three dynasty wide receivers. Right. And, you know, he didn't, he wasn't a bum. He put up like 36 receptions, 400 yards and two touchdowns in his, uh, in his sophomore year. He broke out officially, put up uh, 850 yards, six touchdowns. And this year, he's he's balling out of control. If you if you look at just do this, go to go to Sports Reference and uh, search up Elijah Moore and go pull up his game log, and you will see like what this man is doing is absolutely insane. He's played seven games and he has four, uh, three games with over 200 yards, and he has five games with over 100, and only has one game 
uh, that's below 90. So he has been tearing it up and having a season for the ages. Obviously, Ole Miss is like kind of stinks, but he also is getting it done on the ground. I think they're getting him involved um, with with some screens and and some some plays out of the backfield, which you like to see in terms of his dynamic score. He is on the smaller side, 5'9", 185. So it's not going to really prototype as like that big alpha wide receiver, but we've seen slot guys make it work. So, you know, I think he's someone that you guys should be on the lookout for possibly in the third round of your drafts is a, is a good spot to pull the trigger, but he, he kind of checks all the boxes from an analytical perspective. So I'm interested to see what the, what you guys and all the other film guys get into when they start looking at him. Yeah. And the concern about his size too, like five, nine, isn't great. He's also 185 pounds, which is good weight yeah. for that size, that whole BMI factor. Yeah. The thing is if a team were to invest a day two pick on him, a second or third round pick, which I don't know, is up in the air right now. That means that they're probably going to want to use him in a role that suits him. They're not just going to pick hit a guy that high, knowing his size and be like, okay, go play X, go downfield and maw somebody. You know, the guy's five, nine, you know, he's 185. You know, he's good with the ball in his hands. We see this year, Jameson Crowder, if he could stay healthy, he's basically producing as a top 12 guy. Tyler Lockett isn't a whole lot bigger than Elijah Moore. And he's out there putting up 200 yards and three touchdowns on Patrick Peterson's skull. So I think that the skills that he brings and the production that he has, and I'm not sure about his analytical profile, but you said he checks all the boxes. I wouldn't just write off a player because of their size. I think the NFL is getting a little bit smarter and being like, oh, despite his size, we can use him in this role. We can put him in this role and do this. I think if you're going to invest heavy draft capital in a player, unless you're the Patriots and choosing Nikhil Harry, I think you're going to want to use them in the role that best suits them. So I wouldn't shy too far away from that. And also, I don't want to like upset any college football fans because college football fans are ruthless, Mike. If we leave anybody off that is a huge Ohio State fan, if we leave Chris Olave off, they're going to tear us apart. Again, I'm not a huge college football fan. I don't watch it all the time. I just mostly look into it when it's time to get the job done in the draft guide. Chris Olave is having a great year. I'm pretty sure Ryan Lopes, uh, part of the Breakout Finder, and he goes on Matt Kelly's podcast and stuff. He's uh, a big fan of Chris Olave. He's got a whole bunch of touchdowns. I actually did a Discord discussion. You can check that out on our channel with a guy who is an Ohio State fan. He said that Chris Olave reminds him a lot of Terry McLaurin. Take that for what it is. He's a smaller guy. He's like 6'1", 180 something. Uh, but he is scoring a whole bunch of touchdowns. Obviously plays with Justin Fields and he plays in that Ohio State offense, which is going to help. But he's producing and I wouldn't want to leave him out because we're going to get a whole bunch of comments that if they don't see his name in the timestamps, they're going to be upset. Just know we see it's happening. We're just not watching it actively. Yeah. And then, you know, the position – tight ends that no one wants to talk about is a pretty interesting position to cover this year because Kyle Pitts has been going absolutely ham and he is a move tight end which honestly for fantasy purposes is all that matters uh, but he's an exciting guy to watch out for but what I will say is this I do not like paying up for rookie tight ends uh, like you know except for like I think I paid up one time and that was for TJ Hawkinson because I just like loved him that much but you know I, I do think that paying up like I'm sure once the hype gets in full swing, you're going to have to pay up like a like low to like mid first in that like 1.07 to 1.08 range. And if you have to do that, I'm out at that price because you just have to wait way too long for them to produce. You could always buy them for cheaper the year after because it's always a hard adjustment. So, but he is definitely an interesting prospect. And then you got uh, Pat wait, wait, Put it this way, Mike. Just think about this. In startup drafts this offseason, people were taking Hayden Hurst over TJ Hawkinson after Hawkinson was like a top eight rookie yeah. draft pick the year before if they don't produce year one people are so impatient with a position that we know takes a long time to produce and cement themselves in the league tj hawkinson this year is what top five tight end Noah fam mm -hmm. before getting injured i know he's missed a bunch of games is rivaling that type of per game production and usage people give up on them so quick because they don't produce out the gate kyle pitts to me reminds me a whole lot of a guy like darren waller who isn't a prototypical tight end as you said he's a move tight end He's only about 240 pounds at six foot six. He is extremely athletic. He's a great receiver. That doesn't mean that all of a sudden coming out as a rookie, he's going to produce like a Justin Jefferson, like a receiver is producing or have we have seen rookie, rookie receivers, rookie receivers produce uh, as of late. I completely agree with you. If you have to pay a top six or seven pick on a guy like Kyle Pitts, when you can probably at that price, you know, the two top quarterbacks off the board, probably three running backs. And then you can have your cho uh, choice of like, Chase, Waddle, Devonta Smith, uh, Rondell Moore, whoever you want. I'd much rather take the bet on those guys because the chances that their fantasy stock improves year one to year two or within year one is probably higher than a guy like Kyle Pitts who, you know, we've seen a guy like Eric Ebron go top 10 who was a move tight end who's a really good receiver. He never really panned out until he went to Indianapolis and caught a million touchdowns that one year. So 
uh, as you said, Mike, even in a tight end premium league, it's tough to pass on a rookie tight end because they're hard to come by. But just know that there's a better than not chance that his value is going to either not rise as high or probably decrease in comparison to the other players that you're going to take around there. Yeah, there's only been one tight end that's been drafted in the first first like the first tight end off the board in the NFL draft that's actually increased in value year over year. So just take that for what it is and yeah, David and Joe. Yeah, and if you're going to actually do it, like then just know that you're gonna to have to hold and don't sell. So the worst thing you can do is draft. Okay, the second worst thing you can do is draft a rookie tight end too early. The worst thing you can do is draft that rookie tight end early and then give up too early. That that is the worst combination of things you can go. So to make sure you don't do that, you also got Brevin Jordan out of Miami, also also a pretty studly young prospect. Uh, we know Miami produced a lot of tight ends. You got Jeremy Shockey coming out of there, right? You got going way back, way back. You got uh, Kellen Lowe, all these guys coming out back out of the U. So. Uh, oh, Greg with the third leg also came out of the U, right? So you Jimmy got a lot Graham. of guys coming out of there. Jimmy Graham came out of the U. David a lot of guys. The God. A lot of guys coming out of there, but don't get enticed too much. And he got Pat Fryman. So it's it's a decent class, but I will just say just don't get too overhyped because I see a lot of people saying, like, this is the best tight end class ever. And then, you know, you're going to get caught in, a, caught in a place where you don't want to be investing and getting locked yourself, in, locked yourself up in value of a tight end when you could have gotten like a stud wide receiver, could have gotten like maybe a running back or quarterback that can probably produce for you a little bit earlier. That's all we got for the 21 first rookies. We will give you one bonus. So I'm going to talk about one 2022 prospect who is my favorite player. I don't know if you know any 2022 prospects. If you do. Okay, great. You can talk about yourself. But I'm going to talk about my guy, <laughs> David Bell. Wide receiver one of the 2022 class. When it comes to Debbie, what I found is I rarely, rarely, rarely invest in running backs that are like two, three years out because running backs always emerge like the year of, like they'll break out their junior season. You get guys like Miles Sanders, guys like Jeff, Josh Jacobs, guys like Clyde Rizalaire who like weren't even on the map because like running back is such like a fluctuating position. They have to clear so many hurdles. But what I do like is once I see a wide receiver produce really early, that's when I'll make the investment. Similar to the NFL. It's a very sticky type of value because if someone breaks out as a true freshman, their value is kind of like already really protected. And if they break out a true freshman, chances are they're good and they're probably going to produce again. So David Bell is that guy for me. He plays a Purdue with the potential wide receiver one of this class, Rondell Moore, both hella studs. And they're both actually having a pretty monster game right now. I think David Bell has eight for 104 and two touchdowns. Rondell Moore is 12 for 98 plus three rushes for a touchdown on the ground. So both getting it done both elite wide receivers. If you can, if you play in Debbie leagues, I would grab all the David Bell that you can. He's by no means a sleeper. I think other people probably have him close to the top as well, but he is without a doubt in my mind, the wide receiver one overall, you know, someone else in that discussion was George Pickens, uh, but he plays in a very different offense. Also stud, but I think just David Bell has been getting it done and it's just it's like, you just can't ignore him anymore. Yeah. I know nothing about 2022. I just know that uh, Brees Hall leads all college running backs and rushing yards. Obviously, this year's a little bit different because some teams have played like three games. Other ones have played like nine games. So you have to look at more of a per game basis. But I've heard he's pretty good. Plays for Iowa State. We know who went there. The fat running back in Chicago who absolutely stinks. And I'm not talking about Cordero Patterson. So uh, maybe maybe the legacy that David Montgomery left behind and those big ass fat footprints isn't going to help him when it comes to draft capital. But we're pretty far out. And as Mike said, guys that we've never heard of can maybe cement themselves as the RB1 in this class before we even know it. All right, that's all we got for you guys. I'll, I'll be covering a lot more of this, like, 2021 rookies and 2022 debut prospects over on Market Watch Mondays. Make sure you tune into that stuff uh, coming out weekly. And then, you know, make sure you tune into Noah's Discord discussions. That shit's lit. We got people on there. Some of y'all stink. Like, I, I, can't, I can't lie. Some of y'all They admit stink. it, too. They're like, yeah, this yeah, kind of stinks. All... I look at it. I'm like, yeah. yeah, it does kind of stink. You're right. Some of y'all stink, but at least you know, you know, man. First step is admitting it, and then second step is getting some advice and some counsel, and that's what you guys are doing. So you're taking steps in the right direction. We applaud that. Um, make sure, again, you know, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Give us a thumbs up. Give us a like. Follow us on Twitter. It helps us more than you know. Uh, we love trying to get engaged on this channel. We, we talk back to all you in the comments as much as we can. Make sure you do that. Uh, make sure you cop some Manscaped, man. Use the promo code BDG. Shave your balls. Take care of yourself so you get that action. Put on a birthday suit once in a while. Um, and hope for the best. So that's all we got for you. Peace. 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 Peace.